This episode of Ask Zach is a partnership with True Tone. Well, hello, friends, and welcome to the True Tone Lounge. Today, we are fortunate to have a return visit from our friend John Leventhal, multiple Grammy Award-winning producer. Today, we're going to talk about his first solo album. I'm so glad to be here, and I'm so <laughs> thankful you're willing to talk to me about it. Yes, Rumble Strip, and also, of course, a record label also called Rumble Strip. Yeah, kind of after the fact, but there you yeah. go. I don't yeah. know why. Yeah, we waited till the record industry basically ended to start a record label. There you go. Right. <laughs> and we're going to talk about your acoustic guitar technique, where you use multiple sources, where you use a sound hole pickup, sure. and also either mic'd up. We're also going to talk about the 30th anniversary uh, release of The Wheel. That, sure. That was your first collaboration with Roseanne. It was. Wife. Yeah. So, uh, well, let's dive in. Let, let's start off with uh, let's start off with the solo album. And I just asked, have to ask the obvious question: Is like, what finally pushed you over the edge to finally do this? Uh, an international crisis called the Great Pandemic <laughs> of 2020. <laughs> uh, man, you know that's my snarky answer. I mean, the truth of the matter is, it did sort of. It, if you wanted to know what actually pushed me over the edge, it was that. It. it uh, I mean, obviously, it was something I had been mentioning and talking about for a while. But I really, it's funny. It's uh, even though I know how to write a song and I can kind of play guitar and uh, you know I know how to record and stuff, I wasn't really sure what it was that I wanted to, needed to, should, or feel good about doing. It was. Uh, uh, there's a lot of stuff I love. There's a lot of stuff I'm interested in doing. There were a lot of ideas like circling around my head. There's always ideas circling around my head. But uh, when it came down to the reality of picking like, you know, 35 to 40 minutes of something I felt I wanted to do as a statement or my first thing, it was actually more challenging than I anticipated. So uh, it was probably good that I waited till the pandemic because I really had nothing else to do. And uh, part of the journey was sort of discovering what it is I felt like I could say that didn't make my internal critic cringe, more or less. There you go. I have a big old strong internal critic. That's basically served me well. But uh, sometimes I have to kind of get him out of the picture. So there you go. Or her out of the picture. Yeah. <clears throat> How do how would you st like in any of these compositions? What would they usually start with? Well, that's a good question. So there's a bunch of stuff going on there. Uh, so there were like two ideas. Uh, well, first of all, I don't know how many things are on the record. Like 15. Some of them are really short, folks. So don't worry, it's not that much music. Uh, you know, when I first started, part of my thinking was like, since I tend to co-write with a fair number of artists. And inevitably, uh, and I'm always writing and not always completing songs, but there's, I always have little ideas. And like everybody else, I have my iPhone now. And it's like, oh, here's a good idea. And I had a, a lot of ideas that never found a home. But, you know, every now and then I listen to them and I go, well, I like them if nobody else. So I thought that's sort of what I would do. And that maybe even I would ask all these artists that I've worked with, like, hey, you want to finish this with me? And I wouldn't have to sing and it was sort of, it's a template that seems familiar, like having guest artists. <clears throat> Combination of it being the pandemic and then the reality of actually getting that done was challenging. And then I realized I wasn't all that interested in doing it. So this is a long-winded answer to, there's a couple of things that I had had lying around, but basically it was all stuff I wrote more or less during the pandemic. And uh, some of it, I forced myself not to write as I would normally write. Uh, like there's a couple of things on there, like the title track called Rumble Strip, where it was sort of like, dare I say, I poured myself a whiskey at 9 p.m. And, uh, you know, as I may have mentioned, I have a studio that's more or less ready to go. <clears throat> and I just started playing. And the first thing I played was a little small little motif. I was like, oh, that's kind of a cool motif. Then I would just sort of play a little percussion thing. I have percussion instruments by my console. 
made a little loop, and then I just kept playing. And, you know, by 1 a.m., I sort of had this song that let me play a little guitar, and it wasn't composed or structured the way I normally would. So that was cool, and that's on a couple of tunes on there. There's a, a few vocal tunes that I wrote with... One with Mark Cohn, one with my wife, one with uh, Matt Berninger from the National, a cool mm-hmm. band. And, uh, and then, you know, some solo guitar pieces that are composed that I thought about, you know, and composed. And then I do some uh, eclectic covers of your, you know, Bernard Herrmann and uh, Aaron Copeland and uh, Samuel Barber. So there you go. Yeah. Yeah. So getting down to kind of the nuts and bolts, so would you start off with like a, a click track and oh, starting, okay, yeah. starting with... Oh, the some, reality of yes. how I actually did it, yeah. Yes. <clears throat> and, and then how do you typically <laughs> layer stuff as far as... Because you're playing all the instruments yeah, yeah. on here. With a few exceptions, you're playing everything. You're playing yeah, drums true, and bass yeah, yeah. and everything. Yeah. So how would you typically, you know, kind of build a song? I'm not going to tell anybody. <laughs> <laughs> no, just kidding. Uh, you know, uh, so... You know, this is a thing I've been slowly doing over the years, right? And uh, as I have my own studio now, I'm, I'm clearly doing more of it where I play everything. I mean, it, I can't say I do it the same way every time. Like, I actually put a little effort in not doing it the same way every time. So there's not one answer. Okay. But uh, there is a kind of general sense where uh, uh I will, if I have the initial idea, I will tend to go to some rhythmic percussion slash drum thing fairly quickly, whether it's the ultimate thing, which quite often it is, or whether it's not, to give me a template or a bed in which I can sort of experiment and try. Uh, most of the time, I would say it's to the grid or you know to a click or my version of a click, which is sometimes me playing something that feels really good that I can then loop or whatever. Um, and then I'll go from there. So the, generally the first idea is whatever instrument I'm writing on, in this case mostly guitar, there's a one piano tune on there. And uh, a piano tune doesn't have a click, so that's interesting. Uh, and then I will just... It's like painting to me, man. It's, that's really what it is. I really, I've said this before in interviews, it's like the key for me is to turn off my critical uh, musical director, arranger, record-making mind and just devote myself to what I'm feeling in my instrument. And that sounds kind of corny, but that is kind of what I have to do. I have to like really let go and just play and not filter myself. <clears throat> and as I've gotten older, I feel like I've gotten better. Like it goes, it moves toward the right idea quicker than it did like 30, 40 years ago. So, and to trust the process, uh, because you can always go back, particularly now with computers. And that's how I do it. Now that's on most stuff. On like so, the solo guitar pieces, I, before I record anything, like I'll try to just write the thing and then just try to perform it. Like there's a couple of hymns on the record that are not that. It's just me sitting around like you would, like anybody, playing my guitar, going, "Oh, this could be an idea." Then I'll just work it out on the guitar, and then the key is to get a decent sound and to perform it in a way that feels organic and natural to me. So there's a lot of different ways that I do it. You know, sometimes I'll write. Like that song, Rumble Strip, I literally, all I had was three, four, three, da, dun, ba, ba, ba. that was all I had. Then I really started thinking more about the drums. I didn't want to think about the harmonic or the melodic sense of thing. I wanted to feel what it was going to be. So I spent more time initially coming up with cool drum sounds and trying to find a bed and just playing. <clears throat> and that was it. So what are you fighting with your inner critic? Oh, my God. What is your inner critic doing? I wish doing he could be so here awful. with me now. Yeah. Let's get a mic on him. <laughs> yeah, he has a lot to say. You know, man, I don't know how other people are wired. I'm just wired with a strong... And he's not infallible. And it's kind of like, why is that? I don't know. I have this barometer about things that I think work or don't work or have validity or don't have validity or suck or don't suck. I don't know. And so the inner critic doesn't allow things to, to, to grow or... He or... could think too much toward the end of it before it's necessary. Okay. Like, what's the point of doing this? It wor- okay. He works better. He works better. 
oh man, what am I going to say about my internal critic? Like, he, it, I think his voice starts from a place. So I've been doing this for a long time now, right? God, this is all we've been talking about, how long we've been doing this. So I started producing like 88, that's for real. Like I was producing little stuff before that, but the uh, first record I had that actually clicked was 88. So that's now uh, 30, what is that? 35, 36 years ago. So it probably first started out of insecurity or <clears throat> well, I didn't really know what I was doing when I was starting. It was just going on pure instinct and some sort of drive. Um, and uh, so it, it just is a way, it's just I've always had this thing of like wanting what I did to be good. I never felt like I was doing it to plug into the record industry. Like I've never felt like I've belonged in the record industry any, at, at any time. This is a really esoteric conversation, Zach. I really don't. Okay. <laughs> it's, right. it's getting good. I really it's never felt good. like I belong in the recording industry. I okay. mean, there's a certain way I've noticed certain producers will think about it, and they're good at it, and it's a talent, yeah. and it's great. I wish to God I had it. I just yeah. didn't have it. Okay. I had this other talent where I could play all these instruments and write songs and yeah. stuff like that, right? It's really interesting that you start off with Floyd Kramer's Dream. One, it's a fantastic <laughs> title. Yeah. And two, it's that you're... Even though you are a multi-instrumentalist, a lot of people see you playing guitar. Yeah, guitar player, yeah. And so was that kind of an intentional yeah, you know, I think so. start, start off with kind of a moody piano David Lynch esque Well, let's be yeah. real about it. So what's, what is the template for something I'm trying to do here? I'm not really a singer. I'm a guitar player, right? Yeah. I'm kind of a writer. And the template is like a guitar record, like let's play some guitar and you know play some licks, you know. Yeah. And somewhere in me, I used to be able to play licks, but it's not really what I do. It's not really what also interests me. The minute I start doing this, is here's my internal critic. So you know, we, you and I both share a love for great country and chicken picking and telly playing. We both love Burton, and I mean, yeah. I love all this stuff. And Lord knows, in my time, I've played plenty of it. And I did try a song to be honest, which I'll send to you privately, like where it's like, oh, let me play some telly. Like yeah. in the way that people with guitar geeks would tend to think of it. And I felt fraudulent. And mm -hmm. I'm not saying it's bad. I mean, it's probably decent. Right? Yeah. It's probably good. But I personally, like, I just go, that's just not something you need to be doing. There are plenty of people who can do that. Why would, yeah. you know, as much fun as it would be. That's how complicated I am, folks. I mean, well, that's my, that's my, you crossed a bear. So. Well, and it, and it makes, <clears throat> it makes sense because you, you are able to kind of dip your foot into an influence without it overwhelming you. And so, like, in the, in the tune where you have uh, the two solos and one of them is kind of Cooter-esque and the other one is Clarence White-esque and, and you're playing, you know, the B-Bender on it, it's like you're able to play kind of in the spirit of Clarence without just being just a, a complete mimic, well, which, was a, which was a really great thing because it was also about the feel and the way he would kind of bend the, the, the swing in which he would kind of bend the strings. Yeah, you just oh. gave, gave me a great compliment. I mean, if, oh. that's what I'm trying to do. Thank you, bud. Yeah. So this was, a bit, this was pulling it back to Floyd Kramer's dream. Yeah, so to me it was sort of like going like this is not a guitar record. Right. As though anyone really caring one way or the other. But, yeah. but uh, yeah, it was sort of like, well, I like that Floyd Kramer's dream thing. And also that was the first thing I wrote. That, I wrote that, do you remember the first week of the pandemic? I don't know where you all were, but it was disorienting. We were on the road. We, we canceled gigs and yeah. we flew home to an empty you know, JFK airport. It was really uh, unnerving. New York City was pretty weird for that first month. And somewhere in, so what did I have to comfort me, which was my studio and music and writing. And one night during the first or second week, I went down and I just played that little riff. And it felt to me like it captured for me something. It was unresolved and slightly weird, and, but familiar at the same time. And, and in my mind, that's me playing like Floyd Kramer, even though it doesn't sound like Floyd Kramer. It's kind of this thing you're talking about with Rye and Clarence, who I do, I do love. It just sounded, it, that's what, well, this is what I got out of Floyd Kramer. It's a simple three-note yeah. three thing, but the harmony is not something he would play. And I don't know, when it came time to sequence the record, I, I hadn't listened to it probably at that point for almost a year. And I wasn't going to put it on. I said, no, I like that. It's weird. 
I have no idea what anybody else. My wife didn't get it, so that was disorienting to me. She's like my worst <laughs> critic. Yeah, yeah. I'll, She's like, why are you putting this on there? I love <clears> the <throat> fact that it, it sets the tone. That's the first cut off. Cool. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Me too. And the uh, the bee bender thing is is that a uh, is that a more recent kind of addition to your arsenal because I haven't really heard you do much. Bee yeah, well, I mean, what record? You tell me what artists I produce. I have I well, as uh, you know, I love I do love Clarence. Um, he was a big influence on me. Uh, although I guess if you'd listen to my productions that I've done, you wouldn't really know that, would you? Right. So no, I mean, I've had a bee bender. I had one like that I didn't like for a while, and then I had. Uh, Joe Glazer put one in, uh, Telly, I don't know, not that long ago, you know, before the pandemic, but, you know, like less than 10 years ago, I think. And I never really get a chance to use it or mess around with it. Um, every time I pull it out on an artist or record I'm doing, most the artists, it goes to a place that they don't want to go to, which is cool. But the truth of the matter is, as long as, um, you know, true confessions. I did write a song that was a complete homage to Clarence. And I oh. called it Clarence. And it had nothing to do specifically with anything he would write or anything. It wasn't bluegrass. It was a bee bender thing. And I felt like, like doing like a hot telly playing thing. I felt a little fraudulent about that, so I didn't put it on the record. But I love Clarence. And I wrote this song with Rose, and it had room for a solo. And I tried the bee bender, and yeah. it, you know, a couple of takes. And I was like, oh, well, we're, we're, I could do great. something different, but it's not going to be better. Yeah. And I like it. And this is great because <clears> it's, <throat> a, it's a compositional album. It's not the, yeah. yeah, it's, and I think that's what's great about the, the opening track. It lets you know that this is not going to be, you know, no, sir. John playing a NAMM show licks, no, as, no. as it were. So, yeah, the, uh, the vocal tracks are, are, are great, and it's nice to hear you singing. Well, yeah. I'm getting a lot of that today, which I'm very thankful for, because that was definitely the most nerve-wracking part, for sure. Yeah. yeah so, I, like John Lennon, I hate my voice. So, <laughs> so why did you sing? <laughs> I have no idea why I felt compelled to sing. I really don't. I really don't. And, the, just, and the tunes, the uh, you know, of course, Roseanne sings on a, on a couple two, of them. Yeah, yeah, a couple of them. And uh, the uh, Ar you know Arkansas. That's. Uh, that's a really great tune, and the and but the one the uh, the ghost. I'm trying to remember the uh, yeah. the only yes. ghost. The only ghost. That's a, a really great you know kind of story tune. It tells a great story. Uh, well, there's a story behind that tune, oddly yeah. enough. So uh, you know, Mark Cohn and I have been good friends for a long time, and we've uh, uh, written songs for him. And then Mark had a, a good hand in uh, writing some lyrics with me for this William Bell record I did. So we definitely write songs. Um, turned out. But right before the pandemic, I had mixed uh, Mac Rebinac's last record. Mm -hmm. uh, the producer, a great guitar player, uh, Shane Terrio, yeah. asked me to mix it, which was great. I was thrilled to do it. Um, he had cut the tracks in New Orleans. And, uh, of course, me being me, I was started to think, like, God, it would be great to write a tune that Mac would sing, right? But I wasn't fully aware that Mac was, at that point, quite sick and also had... Uh, I don't know what the ultimate diagnosis was, but it sounded very much like dementia or Alzheimer. And Shane actually did a heroic job of pulling the tracks together because I imagine it wasn't easy. But anyway, so Mark and I had started this tune uh, and it had a few permutations lyrically. We had this lyric and I didn't quite have music uh, that I liked. The bottom line was we didn't, it wasn't appropriate to pitch the tune to Mac for reasons I just mentioned. But I had this lyric I really liked, and uh, I worked on the lyric a little bit, and I came up with a little guitar riff, and I thought, well, if anybody's going to sing about an old musician, I'm qualified now, brother. Yeah. yeah. So um, that's how it was. It was sort of a song that we had started for Dr. John that never got recorded. So yeah. that's sort of yeah. So the uh, <clears throat> the acoustic tones that you get, some of I mean, it it sounds very. Uh, Plunky and fat acoustic sounds. What were some of the acoustic guitars you tended to use? I mean, was there like a whole <clears throat> wide sure. variety of acoustics that you yeah, used? Yeah, and or? I should keep better track than I do. So that is right. my one guitar vice. I don't have a whole big thing about electric guitars, although I have some nice electric guitars. I love old, you know, vintage, really uh, great sounding, you know, Martins and Gibsons and Guilds actually too. Um, you know, and it's like a, I'm just looking for a sound, and it seems like the sound I'm always looking for is something that you're talking about is plunky and fat. 
a lot of clarity and a lot of what I call fundamental tone. I'm never all that interested in kind of a hi-fi, sparkly guitar thing. I mean, if I was Ray Eddington strumming a high string in Nashville in 1965, I would want that. But for the kind of things that I do, uh, I like this kind of like almost in your face, like bold, big sound. And, uh, you know, you know, because guitars are complicated because sometimes they can like a great D28 can sound big and boomy and majestic in a room. But in a track will just be not awful. find its hit space and stuff. I mean, there are things you can do with EQ, obviously. So I guess I just have an ear for certain ones that I suspect will record well. So at this point, I have some good ones. And for the most part, they tend to be what I would call these dried out Gibsons. You know, I have a bunch of, uh, you know, uh, J50, J45, Southern Jumbos, 40s, and well, I have a J35 in the 30s. So from the 30s, 40s, and 50s. And they're great and they record effortlessly. I have a signal chain that apparently works pretty well. There's a, I'll let you all in on a secret. A little bit of compression is your friend. Too much is not your friend. So you got to find that right thing of compression that keeps it solid but doesn't pump or draw attention to itself. And, you know, uh, <clears throat> You know, the placements, and there's no magic. Um, you know, we can talk about this later. There's no magic to the placement. And, uh, and here's the thing, though. I've discovered over the years that I pretty much sound the same playing any guitar and any mic. <laughs> so at this point, I think I'm just forcing the sound out of the guitar. And, you know, and here's this subtle thing that session players, I'm sure, will appreciate. It's like you kind of just learn how to play to the mic and the track. There's just some little adjustment that happens to make it work or something, as opposed to just being off in your own thing playing, right? No, there's nothing wrong with being off in your own thing and playing, because if it's a great thing that you're playing and it's the engineer's job to capture it. But at this point, uh, sort of my interaction with every aspect of the process of, of playing it, of recording it and everything, there's a kind of interactive element where I kind of have a sense of how to make the thing work, if that makes sense. I don't know. <clears throat> so, if you only had two acoustics, what would they be? Ah, specific gear. Um, I know you don't love gear questions. No, no, but, I don't know. mind gear questions. It's just, uh, I really don't mind it. So uh, what would I, I mean, I think I have a particularly, I have a great J35 that just records effortlessly. And then I have a great late 40s um, uh, J50 that records effortlessly. And they have something in common. They're both kind of light and they both sound great with dead strings. Yeah. So on a lot of these tracks, like uh, I can't, it's been a long time since I put a new set of strings on to record something, a long time. In the beginning, it was almost like, well, you should, right? Right. Right, but I don't do that anymore, yeah. unless I want that specific thing. Yeah. The, there seemed to be this period of time where producers were just adamant that you had to have fresh strings every session. Yeah, I think it's been a long time since that's been the case. I, I, yeah. I felt that started to go away in the 90s, you know, sort of maybe even as a reaction to pristine recording and stuff. And, and the brightness. Yeah, and the brightness of it, yeah. 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 <laughs> Chord Monty, uh, tell us about that. <laughs> that one, it's it's. I have no idea. <laughs> I really don't know where they came from. Pretty goofy. I, I mean, at the end of the day, my propensity toward the bittersweet. Uh, it felt like the album needed a little happy happiness. So that was the only thing I had that felt happy. What? I don't know where that song came, man. I really don't know. I swear to God, I was sitting at the kitchen table. I played this little guitar riff. I think it's kind of vaguely reminiscent of Rye. You know, it's like, you know, probably a Rye influence on me. And I just, you know, very quickly wrote a three chord tune with it. And then, well, let me try to record this. And it just took on a life of its own. Uh, you know, it was the pandemic. Here's the weird thing about that tune. <clears throat> it was a pandemic. So you, nobody wanted anybody to come to their space. How weird was that, right? So it wasn't like, yeah. I, and I was like, God, I could use horns on it, right? 
but I was like, where am I getting, particularly a horn player coming in, like breathing like into your space. Now it all seems a little bit overreactive. But um, I have a friend who lives in Bristol, Dave Eggers, who would be, would lead my string sections. And he lived in New York and he moved to Bristol at the beginning of the pandemic. And I had another tune, which I didn't put on the record that I sang, uh, in which I wrote a, screen, a string chart. And I, I, I said, and, uh, I sent it to Dave. I said, hey, Dave, can you put strings on this long distance? And he did. And then I said, and he was doing it in a studio in Bristol in the height of the pandemic. I said, are there any horn players in Bristol, Tennessee? He said, yeah. I wrote, so I wrote a horn chart, sent it to him, and they cut. I wasn't there. They cut it. I mean, they did, they did video me in to hear over my phone, but I said, yeah, it sounds good to me. I don't know. So I cut the, the, the horns in Bristol. And uh, I don't know, man. It was a shuffle, too. So it felt like I felt like uh, you can always use a good shuffle on a record. I've always said that. I still say that. Every record can use a good shuffle. I don't care what idiom it's in. If you listen to my records, there's a shuffle in there somewhere. I like a good shuffle. Yeah. <clears throat> so there you go. And there's tic tac on there. Yeah, there's tic tac. So I got a lot of my little uh, obsess obsessive things in there that I don't, don't normally get to do. Got some B bender on the album. Got yes. some tic tac. Um, I play like a long solo, which I never do. Yeah, Is that, that I, three chord money. Yeah, it, yeah, it yeah. Has, you, yeah, it has yeah, some and nice. It's got thing. some country western swing to it, yes. which I used to play endlessly in bars in New York City. Yeah, in the eighties, man. Yeah. That's what it's. It's fun to kind of get a a good cross section of these of these styles that that you're able to do, but haven't been really showcased on other people's records. Hardly ever, man. None of the country stuff, anyway. Yeah. yeah. On Inwood Hill, you play banjo on there, and that's kind of two tunes that have kind of been sandwiched together that work well. That's exactly what they are. Yeah, I had these two ideas. Your classic. Uh it's like what uh, what the Beatles did on Abbey Road, right? They had all these fragments. Yeah, I had these two. One, I mean, one. The first part is sort of complete. Second part, I had no idea what to do with. I literally just put them together. Oh, those work well together. Yeah, I mean, I have a banjo. It's like a weird banjo. It's uh, like from the '30s, a six-string Gibson. What is it? GB six? GB six? I think it is. I think that's right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's a beast. It is a beast and very hard to keep in tune, but cool. Like it has a sound. It doesn't sound like a, a, a five-string banjo or a, you know, a, a open back banjo. It doesn't sound like that. It has its own sort of very clunky sound, which I like. So, and I have used that on records over the years, as a mostly as a texture, not never as a feature thing. Of all the instruments that you played on there, what what is probably one of them that people would probably be the most shocked that you played on there? I have no idea. Yeah. I really don't know. What would people be shocked that I played? I don't know. Because I mean, you're pl there's some upright playing in there yeah, also, Yeah, well, you know, uh, my good friend Mark Fain is sitting in this room with me, so yes. I'm not going to talk about my upright play. <laughs> uh, I'm an upright owner. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm going to, you know. Uh, you know, man, I bought an upright, and I've, I've always played electric bass. I mean, I was playing bass literally from the minute I started playing guitar. I bought a bass pretty quickly. So, I mean... Uh, and I'm comfortable on electric bass for the music I do. Uh, and it, you know, it's like uh, I can I can make a I can make my upright work on records. I'm happy to play it. I have full disclosure. I have marked off where the fret markers would be mm -hmm. with white tape, and so I am cheating. But uh, you know, I have noticed I'm getting a little more fluid on it. <laughs> so there you go. It's a good one. It's a K. It's a plywood. It records really well. Marcus played it. It's a uh, it's good it's a good recording bass. It doesn't overwhelm microphones. It seems to get in there right. How um, much time do you spend kind of keeping up? You know, like because you kind of have to have chops on different instruments to a degree, don't yeah. you? I mean, like like yeah. if, <laughs> <laughs> like if you're gonna play drums or, or <clears throat> bass on a track, I mean, don't you have to keep up with it <clears throat> to a certain degree? Well, do of you? course, the right answer is yes. <laughs> Uh, but do I do I keep up with it? No, I play. You know, I keep up on it with guitar. Like there's definitely things. Like the other night, uh, last weekend, Roseanne and I did a benefit at uh, a town hall in New York. It's a great little venue, a thousand seater. Uh, it was a tribute to John Lennon for a charity. It's great. It was a cool night. Uh, Graham Nash was there, and Judy Collins, and she's throwing a blanket at everybody else. And Roseanne and I did um, 
uh, just the two of us with m me playing guitar, just a kuzu guitar did, and your bird can sing. Mm. And I'm, I'm sure you people out there, it's an iconic guitar solo. Yes, two it guitars, is. right? Uh, so, and I said, well, okay, I can probably do this. So I worked it out. It's not that hard to work out, but I had to practice it. It wasn't like I was going to schluff it off. Right. So, yeah, I played that sucker for a good 48 hours, yeah, before I got on stage to do it. Otherwise, I wouldn't do it. So, yeah, I play guitar, and I'm always, I always have a guitar in my hand all the time, all day. I'm sure my wife, I mean, she's beyond sweet about it, but I'm sure there are times she wishes I didn't. I play a lot of guitar. I don't play a lot of piano. I don't play a lot of drums. I don't play a lot of upright. Uh, but when I have to, I can get to where I want to go pretty quickly. I mean, the drums are definitely the hardest. Definitely the hardest, you know? Like, I like my drum tracks, but sometimes I got to spend a few hours on them to get them right. Full disclosure. Okay. Electric guitars. What were uh, what were some of the electric guitars you used on the tracks? Oh man, we're gonna have to. Do you have a, a song title list? I've got this is where list. I'm gonna have to see if I can jog my memory. Mm -hmm. Well, let's just see. All right, all right. Uh, okay, on Tullamore Blues, that's a Strat. I have a, a good reissue. Good reissue. I like it. I like my Strat. And it's the middle pickup, which I notice most people don't use, but just the middle pickup. I like it. It's, I call it the Curtis Mayfield pickup. That's the best sound on a Strat. Yeah, I like that pickup a lot. And, and if I get a Strat, I don't think I need any more, but it's always about that pickup. Like, how does that middle pickup sound? Uh, that's all you know about Arkansas. So that's interesting. So Mark Fain and I did uh, went on the road with Rye on and off for a dozen shows or so over a couple of years, and Rye had this uh, solid body premiere. Yes. And I was kind of intrigued by it. And um, uh, I'm not foolish enough to think that if I buy a guitar that Rye has, I'm gonna sound like Rye. Uh, and then it just added, this guy sort of approached me, and he had a particularly attractive one, uh, and, uh, and I bought it from him. And I had uh, somebody put frets on it because it didn't play that well. And man, it's a, just a great guitar. It's got a solid rosewood neck, not even a rosewood finger. It's a solid rosewood neck, beautiful. And has a cool pickup. They're kind of, I guess, Bigsby-ish looking, Bigsby pickup yes. looking. And uh, so on the solo, uh, with a little bit of Leslie thrown in on that is that guitar. And then the next one is this B-Bender that we had been talking about. Am I doing this? Am I going through the list and telling you sure. all what I use? Because this is the gear stuff. Clarinet yeah. Concerto. That's this piece by Aaron Copeland that I've always loved since I was a kid. Always loved it. If you've never heard it, get the Benny Goodman version. Benny Goodman commissioned Aaron Copeland to write a clarinet concerto in the 1940s. And it's exquisite, particularly the first movement, which is basically what I transcribed. Uh, just heartbreaking. I love it. Uh, and I put together a Telecaster with a Bigsby and a wide range pickup, and I love that guitar. It has a good lyrical quality, so that. Both neck and bridge, or just the neck? Uh, just the neck. Okay. Just the neck. Uh, Meteor is a Harmony Meteor guitar. Yeah. Yeah. It's a Harmony Meteor. That's why I called it Meteor, and that's a cool guitar. It's like got those old weird D. Harmon pickups. Uh, I think I had flat wounds on. It's got a Bigsby. Really cool guitar, um, and I played the melody on that. If you only knew, I have no idea. So we're just talking electric guitar here. <laughs> now I'm going to lose the plot a little bit. Uh, and I'm going to lose the plot. The last, on this song, the last song, The Only Ghost, that is that same Strat, that red Strat I yeah. played. Yeah, there's not as much Telecaster on there as I thought. There's no classic Telecaster stuff on there, really. No. I think on a couple of solos, it's probably, you know, I have these Telecasters with mini humbuckers in the neck position that I've had since the 70s. And uh, that's, a, that's a sound I use a lot on records. And I think on sol some of the soloing, that's what I'm using to tell you with that mini humbucker, yeah. The, uh, the, the photo on the, uh, on the cover, is that your son? That is my son. I haven't actually told anybody that. I'll tell you. Yeah. Everybody says, who is that? And I won't tell anyone. I'll tell you. <laughs> yeah, it's a picture I took when my son, my son Jake, was four. I don't know. Three yeah. or four. At the moment I took it, I said, I am going to use this picture. I'm going to use this picture on my record if I ever make one. I swear to God. So I've been holding it for 20 years. It's, it's, an, right. it's a really an amazing photo. Yeah, it's and a it's great a, photo. And, and he's 
posed just well, and the look on his face and is... It, so the weirdest thing, you don't know my son Jake, but it captures him in a... a, a there's like the beauty of the flowers and the seriousness of his face, and that's who he is. He's, the intensity. Yeah, he's, he could be an intense guy. Yeah. <laughs> In the best way. <laughs> yes. Well, let's talk about the uh, the wheel. So yeah. the the wheel uh, has is being re released. It's been yep. remastered, and you're uh, releasing it on Rumble Strip. It's been released. Yep. And uh, it's listening to it. It sounded as if a layer of gauze had been taking off of, off of it it just seemed like it seemed clearer hearing the uh the yeah. remastered version so what what well, was I done didn't, i didn't go to the mastering session but i trusted the guy who did it um and uh i can guess at what he did it does sound better it, i have it, to say i have yeah. to say yeah good man you know and again, and not to say it didn't sound good in the first place, but it, I think... No, no, no. Well, but, uh, yeah, but who knows? Um, you know, that record's 30 years old and was cut on analog tape. And it, this is an interesting conversation. Probably don't want to get too bogged down on it. But yeah, the record was 30 years old, cut on analog tape. And then, you know, there was at some point an analog, and mixed analog tape. So there was an analog to digital transfer in 1991 or 1992. And... Things are better now, right? So something happened in the transfer. So he got the original uh, half-inch two-track masters, and that's what it really sounded like, Wow! what you hear in the remaster, yeah, as opposed to what happened when it got transferred 30 years ago. And I'm, I mean, I'm sure he did a little nice little massaging of the high end and the low end. Yeah, it's pretty amazing, right? It makes you think about, uh, like to go back to, a few other records I did like that. Well, it, it just sounds more in your face. Yeah, yeah. It, it sounds yeah, more yeah. direct. Yeah. 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 So what was it like re revisiting, you know, this album that, that's kind of the beginning, that is the beginning of your collaborations with the... Uh, uh, my wife, yeah. It's like, yeah. Uh, it's, it's beautiful in one sense because I love my wife and we've been together now for over 30 years, so that's kind of amazing. Um, it's, you know, I'm not wired to, like, go back and love what I did 30 years ago. It's just, so it's hard for me. I listen to it, and I'm like, oh, man, why did you do that? Oh, man, why did you do this? It's, it, I feel my, I feel the effort. I feel like I did too much. So on a deeper esoteric level, I think sort of my journey as a record maker, particularly since, like, 2010-ish, this album I did with Roseanne called The List, I feel like I changed the way I approached all this, which is I consciously, I, I just, it was probably a combination of a bunch of things. I got tired of the way I was approaching stuff and I, I just needed to think about things differently. I just started moving toward doing a lot less as a producer and arranger and whatever, all the various facets. When I listened to The Wheel, of course it was in an era where it, she was on a major label, and there was no question that the label wanted hits, right? So I could feel the effort to create this like big sound and this big effort and trying to sort of my idea sounding commercial, which I've never been good at. <clears throat> so I hear all that effort, and it gets in the way f for me. It gets, a, gets in my way, right? Um, so that's complicated for me. Once I sort of felt like I got past the viability of me having hits, you know, around 2010, uh, I think I started making better records. I just, because then it was just like, I'm just all, it's all about the music and the chatter of the record business and record executives and A&R people, just I never paid attention to it. You know, 2008, 2007, around there. So uh, I just think I started making better records and they're simpler and they're more impactful and each bit means more. So it's a little complicated for me, but I can appreciate certainly appreciate the arc of my relationship with Roseanne, which has been nothing short of miraculous and amazing. And then, uh, you know, I think there's a couple of, she wrote some beautiful songs. Uh, let's talk about her. Like, yeah, that song, The Wheel, is amazing. That song, Sleeping in Paris, is amazing. Really great, unbelievable songs. And also, uh, we I think we may have touched on this before. You know, one of the banes of my existence has been finding another guitar player to play.
play the incredible guitar part that Stuart Smith plays on the title track, mm -hmm. which is incredible. It's three minutes of nonstop, unrelenting, perfect time, finger, you know, I assume some sort of Scruggs, you know, banjo roll on an electric guitar. Flawless, perfect. And it is hard to do because I have tried to find people to do it, and it's nobody can really do it. I've tried to get Stuart to come do, you know, we're doing these gigs coming up, um, you know, uh, to just play some of these tunes, and I beg Stuart to do it, you know. And he's in a little band that works a lot called the Eagles, so he can't do it. But um, uh, yeah, Stuart's contribution to at least. Those two tracks in particular was really, really wonderful. The rest of it, I'm just trying to figure out what the heck to do, basically. So let's uh, let's let's change gears. And and since you mentioned Telecasters, when when did you get into the mini humbucker thing and putting that in the neck position? Ah, uh, Jesus, I can tell you that's how geeky I am. Uh, I would say about 1978 would be the year I put it in. Now, why did I put it in? I had a good friend growing up. There were a lot of good musicians where I grew up. So I grew up about 20 miles outside of Manhattan. And, and the music scene where I grew up was connected to New York City, obviously, but it also had a kind of its own scene, right? It's called Westchester County. And there were a lot of good musicians in Westchester County. There really were. And uh, I've talked about Tommy Woke, T-Bone Woke before in interviews. He was a bass player forever in Hall and & Oates and Saturday Night Live. And uh, he was an incredible musician uh, and a couple of years older than me and uh, influenced me a lot, or not specifically as far as playing goes, but to want to be a great musician. Like I recognized that he was a really great musician and I wasn't at that point. I don't know who I am now, but you know what I mean. And, uh, and there was another musician I grew up with, his name was Mark Shulman, and he had an Epiphone that he could never keep in tune. And I was already playing Telecasters, and he was enamored of Telecasters, and I was kind of enamored of the tone he was getting in the neck position of his Epiphone, which had these mini humbuckers in it. So we did a trade. I had a Tele pickup, I gave it to him, and he, had, uh, he took out one of the pickups in his Epiphone about 1978, and I just intuitively, guys were already putting humbuckers yes. into Telecasters in New York. They had just sort of started. And of course, Cornell Dupree had like a D'Armond or he had yeah, something. Yeah, he D'Armond. So yeah. for whatever reason, and for different reasons, the Telecaster was a, 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 a well-used studio player guitar in New York, but not for the twangy thing, that, and not like the Burton thing. It was, right. it was like another, it was an R&B thing, right? And I, I was very much into that. As I probably mentioned, you know, I used to go see Cornell play. This is even before stuff, and it was amazing and stuff. And uh, I, uh, I admired Hugh McCracken a lot. He, play, he didn't really play a Tele, though. He played a Strat and a Gibson 340, which is a weird guitar. Uh, but anyway, uh, by 78, I put, uh, I, and at that point, the Telecaster I had, which I still have, actually, I could never get a decent sound out of that neck pickup. Just sounded thin and useless to me. I never could. And I put a mini humbucker in there, boom, I loved it. Loved it ever since, and I, I find it really useful. It's warm, it's clear, it's not muddy. Uh, it's great for parts, it's good. And so I've, Jesus, you know, now that I kind of put my own tellies together, I've got to have like four, at least four guitars with a mini humbucker. And plus back then, you could buy, the, nobody wanted them in those Les Paul. Right. Uh, in the, I forget what that the model was called. Deluxe. Les Paul Deluxe. Nobody wanted them. They would, people would take them out and put in You could walk, 40, on 48th Street, there were so many used guitar stores, and what I, you know, this lasted decades. I went in one day, and you know, you could buy them for 10, 15 bucks a piece. I bought like four of them, and that's eventually what I put in all my guitars. Yeah, I just bought them, because I just thought, well, I like these, I'll use these somewhere. Yeah. They were so cheap. So there, are there... <clears throat> Uh, this is really going down the rabbit hole. So are there, you know, because there's kind of different eras of the mini humbucker and such. Do you have any era or any, any or actual Gibson ones or other manufacturers or, you know, what are you, do you have any preferences? I thought a little about minis? that. I don't know if I can really weigh on it. So these, I'm assuming, except for the first one that I got from Mark, 
which I have to say does sound a little different than the other ones. Like, why would the Epiphone mini humpbacker sound? And I have an Epiphone Riviera, same vintage. Like, I think Mark's guitar was probably 66, 67. He had, what was it called, a Wilshire or something? It was like a, not an, it was a solid mahogany thin, like an SG, but not that shape. Yeah. Very rickety, you know, very hard to keep in tune. Eventually I bought a Riviera, which sounds great, and the neck pickup sounds ridiculously great. And they're, why they would sound a little darker than the ones that came out of those Les Paul Deluxes, I don't know, but they do. But they're all from this kind of, I would say, 66 to 74-ish era, all the, I, I assume, the pickups yeah. I have. So there you go. Yeah. Yeah, so I don't know. They all had that little blue sticker you know, that you would see on humbuckers too, a patent. Yeah, patent pen, applied for yeah, patent number, there a patent yeah. number on there, you know. Yeah, it wasn't like PAFs, it was yes. like whatever the sticker the was that came after. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. All right, we're gonna talk gear and we're gonna sure. drill down on, on something that uh, I don't know of, of many that do this. So you, at some point, started using a combination of the acoustic guitar sound, the natural sound, and a sound hole pickup. So tell me where this came from. Hmm, God, yeah, it's funny. I knew you were gonna ask me this, but I, now I have to really kind of figure out where it started. I think what happened was I started doing these gigs with Roseanne, uh, just the two of us. So now we're talking 30 years ago, right? And, um, you know, it's just, I always hated the sound of the acoustic guitar, you know, whatever pickups were available at that point, which were mostly under the saddle pickups, I think. There was definitely some sound hole pickups out there. And uh, yeah, it was just always a struggle and so uninspiring, you know, because I'm not really a bluegrass guy. So I, it's not like I'm digging in with a pick and, uh, you know, what I do is kind of subtle and, you know, in between the cracks or whatever. Um, and some point, you know, I think I tried uh, this Fishman pickup or some, oh no, it was a Sunrise pickup. And um, and I just thought, well, instead of plugging it into the house or the PA through a DI, which is what you would normally do, I said, well, let me, let me just try playing it through an amp and then I'll step up to the stage and play it through a mic. And I was like, oh, it's kind of interesting. And then I had my Oh, I'll play it with my pedals. And I was like, oh. And it had a little like electric guitar energy, but it was still an acoustic guitar, so I didn't play it like a Telecaster. I started playing it in this kind of in-between way between an electric and acoustic guitar. And then this is in my nature, you know, I kind of started, I tried a bunch of pickups, and then of course it's I'm reproducing at the same time. And then I'm, you know, it, one thing led to another. And of course, in the studio, it's like, well, you know, this acoustic guitar sound just sounds too normal. Well, let me just take one of these pickups. At that point, I had like a bunch. I had I had a couple of DeArmonds from the 60s, which are very cool, which I like a lot. But they're too, uh, I don't take them on the road, eh? they're heavy and they're hard to mount. So total studio. Um, like I say, I had the Sunrise thing, which I ended up not, not loving, just kind of flat for me. Uh, there were a few others. Bill Lawrence made one in the 70s which was kind of robust and I still use that. I haven't used that in a while, but back in the 90s, I used it more. Um, and then I kind of fell into this kind of uh, Fishman, uh, and it's just insane that I don't know the name. I think it's Rare Earth. It's an active sound oil pickup, and I don't even know if they still make them, to be honest. And that seemed to interact with the amp the best. And then eventually I found an undersaddle pickup I liked. So live, I would have this kind of multi-sourced sound, and it worked, it's a big sound, it fills an auditorium, and uh, I like it. And then of course it had, for me, ultimately a lot of uses in um, the studio. And I never use the under saddle pickup in the studio, but I will mic, you know, one of my great acoustics, um, and I'll swap out pickups, or you know, put uh, any number of pickups, different ones, depending on the tune, experiment a little bit. Put it through my pedals, put it through an amp, and just mic the guitar as I normally would, and lo and behold, it's kind of, it's a pleasing, town, uh, pleasing sound. Gives it a little kinetic energy, gives it a little vibe. Uh, some of the solo pieces on my solo record called Rumble Strip, out January 26. 20, yeah. Um, has this sound, um, so that I can sort of play, you know, you know. It 
just gives it a little vibe that I like. It's appealing, it's fun to play to, so I feel inspired when I play to it. I like the sound, you know? It's partly electric, you know? That's the history of it. So, so in the in the studio, you'll use one of your normal recording yep. dried out old wood Gibsons or whatever, yeah. and you'll slap you know one of these different sound hole pickups depending on the song and depending on the vibe, and you'll run it through pedals or an amp, and that's you'll know, have the acoustic mic'd up, and then you'll run the sound hole pickup, and you'll mic up the amp, and you'll mix the two, and then live, like on this guitar, you've actually got two jacks. Yeah. So so you've got. <laughs> <laughs> two jacks on the end of it. And so one is the sound hole pickup and the other is the kind of under saddle or, uh, you know, in the body type pickup. Yeah. And, well, the two jack thing was uh, was an interesting thing. I came to that through, uh, believe it or not, through Emmy Lou Harris. We did a gig with her and it was just a trio. It was just me and Emmy and Roseanne. And... I got to the gig and uh, I took out my acoustic guitar, <coughs> which had my whole setup. And at that time I was using a stereo jack in the one jack. So I had to bring this stereo cable with me every time I did a gig. And I took my guitar and I played a chord and the top of the guitar literally came off the body. It literally cracked <laughs> all with uh, like a half an inch from the top all the way around. Wow. Luckily, Maple, her guitar guy, tech guy, had she had an extra and she had two pickups in hers. She wasn't using an amp or anything. And I said, oh, he had two jacks. And I was like, oh, of course, I need two jacks. So then I did it to all my guitars. So one jack goes to the amp, one jack goes to the house. Um, well, on stage anyway. Like I say, I very rarely use the pickup. and I don't think I've ever used this pickup in a recording situation, but live, I do use it. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, so basically that's what I do. I uh, throw these pickups on and, uh, you know, I'll do all sorts of stuff. Like, I think on, maybe on that, the, this tune called Jail's Hymn Number 2, I even put a little Leslie in there too, like a classic Leslie guitar thing, just underneath it, just to give it a little texture. One of the nice things about this setup is that it, it gives you the power to kind of compete with an electric guitar player and have and have presence. Yeah, on stage, for sure, yeah. yeah. And so I assume that was necessary when you were playing with Ry Cooter and such. When there were dates where you were playing with uh, Rosie yeah. and Ry. Yeah, I think so, a little bit. I think it gave it a little vibe. I think he was intrigued for a second, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it has a sound. Yeah, like what I say, I guess it's, uh, dare I say it's my sound, you know, it's like, uh, it's something that I've gotten comfortable with, and it's like something where I feel like I actually have a voice. Let's say, as opposed to me going and recording some, even if I could do it competently and well, uh, like some great hot, like country, you know, telly, you know, string bending, chicken picking stuff, or whatever. Yeah, this feels more like who I'm supposed to be playing like this, you know, with this sound. Even if I play. <laughs> Even if I play kind of hot licks, it feels more like me to do it like this. I don't know why, it just does, you know? Yeah. I feel more honest about it or something. And, and let's just, this is, a, uh, this is a Collings OM, is that what this is? This is a Collings OM, so the people at Collings have been very nice to me. Um, uh, and th these are my road guitars. Uh, I may have used this uh, on a couple of recordings. And I have one that I've had for almost 30 years too, so I have that, and that's the one that fell apart that luckily a luthier in New York was able to put back together. And it had a neck I like, it was very comfortable. I will say that live, the, and this is to take nothing away from Collins because they're really good people and they make great guitars, and same with Dana Bourgeois because I have one of his guitars. It, it, the guitar isn't as important as you think, as as the sound source. The, once you're on stage, the sort of th these guys and the pedals and the amp sort of have more to do with what's going on. Plus, in the studio, I have like I have uh, a, a guitar I've used a lot, a lot, and particularly on this one Marcone record, I have this mid '60s Guild 
M20, bottom, their bottom of the line, all yep. mahogany guitar. Yep. I wouldn't say you'd pick it up and go, this is a great guitar. It's kind of a weird, funky guitar, and I literally haven't changed the strings on it in two decades. I'm scared to death that I'll break one of them. And that has one of these pickups on it, and I use that a lot in the studio. It just has a vibe. It has a character. I'm not trying to sound like a great acoustic guitar. I mean, I like great acoustic guitar sounds, but I'm not invested in replicating that somehow. So it's not as guitar dependent as you would think. It's nice to have a nice acoustic guitar sometimes, but not all the time, particularly in tracks. It's not, I'm just looking for a good sound, inspiring sound, you know, that works and feels musical to me. And you're using a tuning where you tune the low E string yeah. down to C, and you tune the A string down to a G. Yeah, which is the thing, um, you know, obviously I, I use a lot, right? Um, I write a lot with it, and, uh, you know, so it's kind of part of my arsenal of stuff. Are there other tunings that you would use? There aren't other tunings I would use as a matter of course, but there are, uh, depending on what a track needs, I'll tune my guitar in the weirdest tunings possible if I think there's a sound or a voicing that will make the track really cool. Yeah, yeah but I don't, I, I use this tuning a lot. I always have a guitar in the house that's tuned to this tuning. It's, it's for me, it's very useful. You know, we've, I think we've talked about it before. It's just, it has, it has a lot of sounds that I like. So it's very useful to me. I mean, you can play every, you know. You know, you can play R&B on it. You know, you can do anything. And a few of the solo guitar pieces on my record were written in the studio, so there you go. Okay, <laughs> let's talk briefly about the, uh, the pedal board. So these these are kind of uh, similar pedals to what you... How uh, exciting. Yes, similar to what you would normally use, this uh, Mirage compressor and the Boss Tremolo and some of these other things. Yeah, and this so, is exactly what I would use, yeah. So it's it's interesting, you've got both of the delays going right now. Is, yeah. is that something you would typically do with, with these? Live, to, yes. Recording, not necessarily. Or, and and so you've got the, the analog delay, the DM3, you've got that set to a slapback. Yeah, so this is live. So first of all, we could talk about how much I love the original Boss analog delay pedal. I just think it's a great pedal, folks. Yeah. I mean, I think they've reissued it and it sounds okay. For some reason, the originals have some little weird thing to it that I like better. Yeah, they're useful. Um, and I do use it a lot live, and I do use it a lot in the studio. Even if you're not hearing the slapback, it's just a slight thickening to the sound. Yeah. I like I like it quite a bit, and then in this case, I mean, we're not really hearing the delay. Well, I'm not in the control room, but I don't think we're really hearing it. I mean, if I if I did that, you might hear it. It's just to give the guitar a little a little weight, you know, a little feeling, right? So how will you tend to use like will, will you have slapback on most of the time when you're playing guitar live? In this setup, if it's just me on the acoustic guitar, yes, yeah. it feels big. I turn a lot of times I'm going like man, which why, why do I have that on all the time? And I turn it off and I go, I put it right back on. If you're if you're playing in a big auditorium, you know, and it just makes the guitar sound majestic. Then I'm not doing it to have a rockabilly thing. I'm not doing it right. to, have, to hear the slapback. I'm doing it to give my sound some musicality and character. Yeah. And then you're, you're not hearing this and going, oh, that sounds like a rockabilly. You know, right. Right. It just it just is a sound. Yeah. It's a sound, right? And then the uh, this line six Echo Park is, is doing a, a tape delay in a kind of a longer time. Yeah, let's talk about the line six Echo Park. A uh, very uh, I notice that your pedal snobs are quite dismissive of it. At this point, I have tried so many delay pedals. Uh, I still like the sound of this better than any of them. It sounds great. It does, and you can f it up really well. Um, and I don't want to do it because it's like one of my tricks, and then then what do I got left, folks? I don't know. But there are ways I've used this endlessly in records to create ambiences and sounds and drones, and um, it's it's a good. I like pedals that you can mess with and make them f up a little bit, you know. Yeah. 
And the uh, the Mirage compressor, you like? Mirage compressor, it's, it's kind of as we've subtle. talked about, yeah, yeah, I think it's a great compressor. It doesn't, you don't hear the compression, but it solidifies the sound in a very, to me, a very musical pleasing way. I don't use a squash sound ever really, yeah. but um, you turn that on. Now, if I'm playing live, I don't use it so much with the acoustic, maybe. I don't use it really for that, uh, but with a Telecaster for me live, I basically keep it on. It just solidifies the sound. I don't have a lot, like I say, I don't use a lot of compression, but I like it. Uh, uh, I really do. It's a very simple sound that uh, that Boss Tremolo, if you get it tweaked to do what you have here so the level is matched. And then, of course, we've talked about the Mostortion, which uh, I've been using since like 1980, whenever they first came out. And the, the joke is I literally bought it because I thought the name was hysterical. You have distortion and then you have more distortion. Right? So... Uh, I couldn't resist it. I bought it, and it turned out I loved it. And then who knows, like 40 years later, everybody wants one. It's just crazy. Yeah. Became cool later yeah. on. All right. Well, your album releases January 26th. That is correct. Yes. Rumble Strip. Everyone needs to go out and check it out. It'll be on, uh, will there be physical copies of it? Uh, you know, originally uh, uh, I, I didn't think I'd bother with it, but apparently there's enough demand that I think we'll be creating some physical product, yes. So, But otherwise it'll be on your normal... Uh, All your I'm, streaming Apple things. There's a couple of Spotify. tracks out now. I don't know when we're going to be seeing this, but there are some tracks. It'll be early it's, January. Yeah. So in early January there will definitely be there a couple of things out. I made a video. <laughs> Really? <laughs> yeah. And I'm, What's about that. I'm not going to say any more about it. You'll have to, if you're interested, go find it somewhere. Uh, but the record's out. Uh, you know, it's uh, going to be a tough sell. It's an odd record, but there you go. Well, John, thank you so much Zach, for man, coming down. Zach, man, it's good to see you. And I so appreciate, you know, the, the, the support and uh, your interest in any of this. So it's uh, thrilled to be here. It's good, and it's good to see you and talk shop. Well, thank you. Bye-bye.